we, we, so today we are meeting to talk about pet insurance. And first of all, Steve, thank you very much for answering my question. I don't know, it was maybe two months ago. I was doing my due diligence, trying to understand better pet insurance and this entire thing. And you were one of the people who were very nice to answer my question. And, you know, we have a cool conversation. And from there, there was a very serious question that came out of it. Do dogs smile? <laughs> Yes, well, I can confirm they do. I have a, a, an English Springer Spaniel called Lola who actually does smile. Literally, if you've come back, haven't been out for the day, she'll literally show her teeth in a smile. It's just the funniest thing ever. Um, like when she sees the food delivery uh, chap come uh, to deliver groceries, she knows he'll have a treat for her. Big smile. It's hilarious. She's well known in the, in the, in the local uh, area. <laughs> and I thought that only human smile because anywhere else showing the teeth is kind of a point of aggression, no? But yeah, and you have to be careful if you've got young kids coming around. She'll smile at them. She loves young kids, but they go, whoa, okay, that looks scary. You have to say, no, no, there's Lola's. This is a friendly smile. This is her showing her teeth. But yeah, and what's really interesting is she was one of eight in a litter, and uh, uh, five of the eight can also smile, which is, uh, huh. I, I find, amazing. Oh, I love that. So, uh, I'm sorry, let's, let's talk about, so you have... Lola, any other pets? Uh, tropical fish. Tropical fish, yeah. much better than what I have, which most likely at this point, well, uh, still managing to keep uh, the few flowers and plants here alive, but I imagine that the ones in LA are a little bit dead at this point. <laughs> I need to do a quick jump there to water the plants. Um, but let's jump into insurance. Uh, do you mind sharing with the audience a little bit background about yourself? How did you get into insurance? Sure. So never planned a career in insurance, it would be fair to say. Uh, my background originally, I have a PhD in nematology, which is uh, microscopic worms. Uh, so I was looking at environmentally friendly alternatives to pesticides to control insects. Um, so I got my PhD from Imperial College back in 99, uh, decided that wasn't for me, decided I wanted to get into software development, uh, actually moved to Dublin in Ireland, which in 99 was kind of dot-com boom time, loads of software being exported from uh, Dublin. And that was where I first got into insurance. Uh, I joined a, a startup called Selector. They just raised 35 million euros of funding to, to create a financial services comparison shopping platform, uh, white label B2B. So if you wanted to get excuse me, uh, home insurance, auto insurance, travel insurance, credit card loans, switch your gas and electricity supplier. You could do that all on our platform. Uh, so I joined as an office administrator as a temp. Three and a half years later, I was running the business um, and ran that business for about three years. Um, then I had a little bit of a break from insurance. I was heading up a computer simulation modeling business, an oil and gas consultancy. I spent nine years, of which five and a half were CEO uh, at Syscon Justice Systems, which is a uh, the global leader in offender management software. So managing offenders in prison and jail. So I've been in prison and jail a lot. Don't recommend it. I uh, have some uh, amusing beer stories of taking my board to uh, Las Vegas for a board meeting and visiting one of our clients, Clark County Jail, which, uh, which services the strip. Uh, so we had an interesting experience for the board and investors that day. Uh, ride on, uh, ride alongs with LA police, uh, uh, sorry, LA Sheriff's Department on a Friday night and car chases. So yeah, very exciting uh, role. Uh, but not really insurance related. Um, so I did that up until 2016. Uh, and then I'd relocated the family to Vancouver for that. When we came back to the UK, uh, I got introduced to Stephen Mendel, the, the CEO and co-founder of Many Pets. Well, it was bought by Many, it was called at the time. Uh, so I joined them. Um, and when I joined, there was 20 of us. We were like a startup. It was 20 of us, 20 of us in a small office in London, less than a million in revenues. Um, Fast forward from 2016, in 2017, we launched Pet Insurance. Uh, in 2021, we raised $350 million in our Series D funding, a $2.2 billion valuation. Um, and uh, earlier this year, we, we hit over 600 employees. So it's been an amazing journey, uh, as, as well as being on the, 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 the global exec team, kind of overseeing the whole strategy for the business. Uh, my, my real responsibility or accountability was everything many pets did outside of the UK. So I, I led our launch into Sweden in 2019 and, and, and that team continued to report through me. Uh, I led our launch into the US in 21, um, uh, which was really interesting because it was during COVID and, and lockdown. Uh, also led our acquisition of a US insurance carrier. 
Um, so yeah, it's been an amazing seven years, uh, lots of fun along the way, uh, but I did leave uh, many pets uh, earlier this year and are now uh, working with actually a company that share the same investor, Octopus Ventures, a company called Vitesse. Um, so Vitesse offer uh, treasury management and, and payment services to the insurance sector. So one of the services uh, they offer, for instance, is uh, loss fund optimization. So if you're an insurer, you might have a whole load of TPAs administering claims for you. Those TPAs are a whole load of bank accounts with the claims funds in. So for Tesco in, audit those, identify where there's funds sitting in legacy accounts, uh, return those to the insurer. Uh, they then also migrate all of those remaining funds to be managed via their platform. Uh, the funds are kept in tier one banks, so a lot more safeguarded than maybe they would have been with the TPAs. Um, but that gives the uh, insurers uh, visibility via the platform, sort of real time of all of their claims funds. So they can be much better at optimizing where they deploy their claims fund. Um, Vitesse believe they can actually return about 70% of uh, insurer funds, claims funds back to the insurer, which is, is pretty significant. Wow. Um, and then final point is they've also developed a, a global payments network, which means they can uh, pay claims. I think it's in 172 currencies in 109 countries. So again, really interesting business, continuing my uh, insurance journey. Um, so sort of helping them with their US expansion plan uh, and, and, and sort of insurance knowledge. So should we talk about payments and insurance or, or, or pet? Because both of those topics are very interesting. Uh, I mean, well, why don't we go pet insurance? We were going to go pet insurance. Very happy to touch on the Okay, tech. Uh, okay but, sure, no let's, problem. Let's start there and see where we go. No, because I'm, I'm still, you know, stuck a little bit about the fact that your career, you started as a doctor or PhD in microworms, and from there you moved to full-grown animals that we call them pets but that's fine um uh, and that was a really bad joke as i as i think about it but the main topic of the day is pet insurance what exactly is pet insurance what is the coverage because when i started to look into that and i was looking at the nicks and all the different uh, definitions the underwriting was like mm, 200 if it's a dog 250 if it's a cat and let's double it if it's in a farm. That's more or less. And part of it under, a, a, what was it, a animal stock? Another one is under home insurance. Yeah, so in the US, it's definitely interesting. Some of it comes under inland marine. Some of it comes under animal livestock. So it's a challenge. Um, but uh, pet insurance really covers you for those unexpected events. So sickness, uh, sickness, illness, uh, or accidents. Um, and, and really the rating factors, uh, it's fairly straightforward. It's breed. Obviously, that has a big, big difference. What the breed is, uh, the sex of the animal, the age of the animal. It's kind of like the first year. You tend to see quite high loss ratios or a lot of claims because pets, particularly puppies, ingest socks and all sorts of things. Uh, so year one of owning a pet from an insurance perspective tends to be a bit expensive from the insurance perspective. Then you kind of have a three or four years where typically pets are generally healthy and then you get to kind of year five six and then you start to see just just like we do as we get old you start getting uh, medical conditions cropping up um uh, and, and then you'll see that the loss ratios will, will increase and therefore prices will increase um uh as the as, as the pet ages uh the other the other key one of the other key rating factors is is a zip code location so you take your pet to uh, veterinary surgery in the center of Los Angeles is going to be very expensive compared to maybe going to a, a, a veterinary surgery in a, in a rural area of South Dakota, for instance. Does that, that answer your question? Yes. And then the, what we see, there are two different products. There is um, the pet insurance and the, oh, I just the wellness. forgot the name. The wellness. wellness yes. Yes, so what's, but, what's the difference? Yeah, so as I said, insurance is really for those unexpected events, uh, um, whereas wellness, I see, is more preventative. So it's uh, and, and wellness products would typically cover things like your annual veterinary checkup, your your flea tick and worming tablets, your vaccinations, possibly dental cleaning. Um, so it's very much preventative as opposed to something bad's happened that was unexpected. Like, you know, you have to get your pet vaccinated. You know, you have to get an annual checkup. You know, you have to get your pets, uh, your dog's teeth cleaned every probably three years. That's preventative. Um, it's not unexpected expense. 
And one of the things that I was looking in, I was actually a little bit puzzled about it. According to the regulators, you can offer one of one or the other. You cannot offer both of them because that may confuse people. Are you familiar uh, with this? Yeah, so this, this is interesting. I think the, the, the Pet, Pet Insurance Model Act that came out last year has tried to address that. So, and actually it is interesting, particularly in the US, when, when, before we launched in the US, we did a, a lot of research to, to understand the market. And one of the early uh, findings was a lot of people thought they had pet insurance, but actually had pet wellness product. So that meant that they thought they were covered against accident, accident and illness. But when that happened, they went to the vet, got an expensive treatment, potentially put in their claim to their wellness provider. Wellness provider would reject it saying, well, you're not covered. They'd be annoyed, go to the regulator and say, hey, I've been ripped off. Um, and it's just really this educational piece, I think, that people don't quite understand the difference. Um, so the regulators, you are, well, they're, they're making it harder for sure. I think that the Pet Model, Pet Insurance Model Act is definitely trying to push wellness providers down the regulated product route. So they're kind of saying you can't sell wellness and insurance in the same sales process. Um, you, uh, you can't advertise them together so there can be no confusion unless you filed your rates and forms for the wellness product as either an add-on to your insurance product or as a separate regulated product, in which case you can. So I think it's definitely they're trying to push wellness providers down that if you really want to sell it alongside insurance, you need to get regulated. And what is all the mix-up in terms of the underwriting in the different states that part of it is in and marine and the other one is livestock? Yeah, that is just, it's, I, I don't know the answer to that. It's kind of okay. one of those, every state is different and sees things slightly differently, which is is is, is challenging. Like when you come to the US, I mean, we're, I'm from the UK, launched a business from the UK into the US. It's like mm -hmm. dealing with 50 different countries because every regulator in the 50 states in Washington, D.C., has slightly different nuances around the regulations and even what class it, uh, as you say, of insurance is it inland marine, is it animal livestock? Uh, and there is another one, uh, in another, there's one other one I think, I can't remember what it is, but uh, there's, there's a third option as well. So while we, are, I'm, I'm, while we are talking about the different products and the coverage, and you just mentioned the different states plus DC. So you launched the product in the U.S., in Sweden. You took the, the concept that what we've seen in the U.K. What's the difference between the different countries in terms of the product and the coverage? We'll talk about the culture and how it's being yeah. consumed. In a... Yeah, so uh, there are differences. Uh, so, for instance, uh, liability. So if you go to Germany, for instance, it's, it's compulsory to have liability as part of your policy. Um, that's not the case in, in the UK and Sweden. Um, I think um, in, um, in the US, for instance, it's quite commonplace to have unlimited vet fee cover. So there's no ceiling on how much you can claim. Um, and actually, that's, uh, that sounds great from a customer perspective, but it's very rare that you get a really big insurance claim. I mean, last year, the largest two pet insurance claims in the US both for dogs, both had pneumonia, it was, uh, and they were $60,000. I think the year before, the highest claim was $79,000. These are still big numbers, don't get me wrong, but unlimited, you kind of think millions, I think. And uh, it, it's um, going from a sort of $15,000 coverage limit to unlimited is actually not necessarily a huge amount of difference in terms of underwriting cost. So you mentioned liability. In the US, it's mainly kind of a health insurance however there is no liability no. but in the uk there is liability uh it's, it's an option um it's an um, option you can take uh, you can get separate liability only policies um you can get them on some policies as add-ons um it's, it's a sort of it's, it's not compulsory though no so let's talk actually about what's so amazing about pet insurance yeah i see so many competitors so many entrants who are going into the pet insurance there is only i think so far if we are looking at the u.s only two percent a market penetration or but while you have three percent three percent so tell us what's what's so interesting in the pet insurance here in the u.s yeah i think i think it's uh the fact that as you said penetration is low uh, sort of only about three percent of cats and dogs are insured compare that to the uk 
it's about 28%. Uh, in Sweden, it's about 50%. And if you just took dogs only, about 90% of dogs are uh, in, insured in Sweden. And, and I have some thoughts about why that is. But um, I think if for the US, penetration is low, but growth rate is, is is really taking off. If you look at the NAPFIA, which is the North American Pet Health Insurance Association statistics, they publish them every year. You can see every year for certainly the last four years, the growth rate in uh, gross rent premium has been over 24%. Um, uh, the number of pets being insured has been over 20 percent uh, increase year on year for the last four years. So it's just small penetration. So lots of lots of opportunity in the market. High growth rates. Um, I think it's uh, millennials are, are typically getting pets rather than having kids at a younger age. So I think they're, they're uh, and they're very much classing them as their fur babies and wanting to have the best care for them possible and insuring them. So I think it's yeah. Big opportunity market in terms of potential growth, plus it is growing really quickly. So we talked earlier about claims, and needless to say that now it slipped my mind. There is one company that holds the patent on on paying directly or re- reimbursing oh, directly Panion. the vets. True Panion. right. How other companies are overcoming that? Because it's certain, it's a type of a moat, which is just another hurdle in the payment and the customer experience. Yeah, so uh, so True Panning do own, uh, uh, own the patent for in, uh, systems integrations with uh, veterinary practice management systems. So they have a product, True Panning Express, which integrates with a veterinary practice system. Um, so you go into the practice um, and uh, the, the, the practice nurses can see whether your pet is insured by True Panning or not. Uh, if it is insured by Trupanion and you need to make a claim, that's all fully integrated system. The claim goes out to Trupanion, and in theory, it comes back quickly. It's direct payment to the vet, um, and so the customer's not out of pocket. So, um, so that, that's the, that's the premise of uh, what they're trying to achieve there. Which it was is a that is to me probably the biggest pain point for pet insurance is the trying to find a way that the that the customer is not out of pocket uh, in the U.S. Uh, there's a statistic I, I read on a few sources that I think it's 57% of U.S. citizens can't get their hands on more than $500 of credit. So even if you can afford to take out wow. pet insurance, which is great, you turn up at the veterinary clinic with a, a dog with an injured knee, you get a $5,000 veterinary bill, you've got trouble paying that while you're waiting to be reimbursed. So um, so uh, th- th- this is, for me, one of the, the key um challenges to solve in, in the pet insurance market, particularly in the US. So how do other pet insurance companies overcome that? Do they make does it do they force their customer to, to pay out of pocket and then reimburse them? Or... So that's typically and it's really interesting because if you go to Sweden, mm-hmm. uh, 90% I want to say of claims in Sweden are paid directly to the vet, not to the customer. So vets are all very happy to deal with pet insurers. They recognize the fact that uh, pet insurers are providing a service to their, to their customers that enables the vets to, to, to get the funds to treat pets. And that's what vets want to do. They want to treat sick animals. Interesting, when, when we did our research before we launched in the US uh, and did a number of one-to-one interviews with, with, with vets in, in the US, it was a really different situation. And vets were like, don't want anything to do with pet insurance which we're like oh that's weird why is that and and how we kind of what they told us was that they're really worried about pet insurance going down the route of human health insurance oh, where right. the human right. health insurers start dictating well we're only going to pay this much for an mri scan or a ct scan and they're like we don't want anyone telling us what we can charge and so there's a i think that will change over time but at the minute uh Vets typically are, are, are not not engaging as much as you'd expect uh, w- w- with uh, pet insurers. Well, in the US, it's so complicated that you actually have a profession that you need to hire, which is medical billing professional. So you, a, a clinic will hire a person who went through a course, a three months course, got a certificate, and that's their job is to make sure that they can actually bill. And, and and manage the relationship with the different insurance companies to make sure that money is coming in back to the clinic. It's uh, sometimes I find it sad. Oh, okay, we we'll leave it. We we'll leave it to a different podcast. 
for now, let's focus about uh, pets and the different challenges. Now, just, you, just one last point on that, yeah, though. It please. is interesting that um, uh, in the US, we still get claim handwritten kind of veterinary notes uh, faxed over to us, um, which in this day and age finds I find astounding. Yeah, I mean, we're talking very small mum and pop shop uh, veterinary clinics, but yeah, it's... Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a real range of um, uh, IT sophistication in the veterinary clinics. Would be fair to say. So, what is the competition about in the US? Is it more trying? Is there different coverage, better underwriting, just getting your brand known and distribution? So, taking money from one VC or a few VCs, giving it to Google, so people will know about you. Because we already understand that there is a challenge to embed yourself into the system of the vets. So how do you overcome it? What's the competition? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I, I think when we launched in the UK and Sweden, <clears throat> we were very much able to differentiate on the product. Um, and also pricing. Kind of pricing would be part of your secret source that you didn't want your competitors to know about. Uh, and competitors will have bots scraping your site trying to work out reverse engineer your rates but your rates are a big part of your secret source when you come to the us you have to file your rates it's like a 90 page document it outlines exactly all the base factors you use and what 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 multiplier you use for each zip code and for each breed and and, and that information is public as soon as you filed uh, and even kind of worse than that in terms of differentiation you can do what's called a me too filing as you'll know where you just go to the regulator and say, I'm going to do a Me Too filing on many pets. You can copy our policy wording, just change the logo uh, and copy our rates. So it's difficult to innovate, I think, uh, and differentiate on, on, a, on a product perspective because it's so easy to copy. Um, so I think you have to differentiate on brand. Um, so build a great brand. Uh, and also, ultimately, insurance is all about when you make a claim, you want your claim paid quickly uh, and efficiently. Um, and so it's that claims experience, I think, is where you really have an opportunity to differentiate. Uh, and if you look at the companies in the market that have got great trust pilot scores, it's usually about great claims experience. Those that have got poor reviews, it's usually about the claims experience. So you've got to you've got to you've got to have a great uh, claims experience. Um, and I think also uh, certainly in the last couple of years, um, distribution. I mean, for any insurance company, consumer. B2C uh, insurer distribution is always key, but in the US, the cost of acquisition through like Google um, or, or even just sort of affiliates like the, the the pet insurance review sites just really went through the roof. There was so much competition from new entrants just clamoring to get uh, get those uh, sales that just the just the whole cost went up just due to the, the competition. So I think when we we looked at um, uh, the cost of um, PPC, sort of Google uh, search uh, back in 2019 before we launched, it was basically £2.50 a click in Sweden. It was about £4 in, in the UK, about £5 in the US. But between 21 and 22, the US went up 50% on Google. Um, and it just got to, it, I just felt last year, it got to the point where the cost of acquiring customers through either Google or particularly some of these um, affiliates just got unsustainable. So I think if you can come up with a distribution method that, that, that reduces your cost of acquisition, so whether that's, um, well, SEO is an obvious one and with your, your large language uh, models now and GPT-4, it's, it's easier to, to create content uh, um, potentially. Um, but if you can go to where your customers are rather than them coming to you. So embedding your your, your insurance elsewhere um, and, and you can be successful there, then I think that's uh, going to help you differentiate as well. Yeah, what I've seen so far between buying expensive ads on Facebook, Google, etc., if you try to somehow embed themselves in different networks of vets and then there is a question of, okay, how is that... Now, are we running after different vets? And how can you actually embed yourself in the system if you have a patent kind of uh, limitation there? Are they try to embed themselves with affiliates, so vitamins and food and uh, other uh, pet shops? Because, hey, that's a point of a transaction. You get the dog with the insurance already attached to it. There you go. Good luck. 
Um, it, it will be interesting to see. Somehow, as I said, it just converges into brand recognition. And I think that what you mentioned earlier in terms of the claim process, that's the most important part. Will that be, you know, what will actually help you to retain? So we shifted again from customer acquisition to customer retainment. And that's when retention is ch sometimes is actually cheaper, especially when, well, unless it's claims, but then it really depends on your policy and numbers. Do you want to retain a customer that made the claim or do you want to let them go and move on for, let's call it fresh risk? Yeah, and I think it's um, the, the whole um, sort of pet ecosystem. It would be interesting to see how that morphs over the next little while. I think everyone wants to be the center of the pet ecosystem. Um, and you've got the likes of um, uh, Jab, for instance, who have been acquiring a number of pet insurers like Figo and um, Pumpkin mm -hmm. and Pet24. They've also uh, acquired uh, veterinary clinic chain, um, uh, what are they called, uh, uh, um, VHA, I think they're called. So they're kind of, interestingly, their model, uh, which could be an interesting one for distribution, is they've got the veterinary surgeries, they've got the insurance, so you could see where that could, and I don't know what their plans are, I'm just surmising here, that they, they will move to more of a, you're either in network or not, a bit like human health insurance. So mm -hmm. if you want to go to a vet that's not in their chain, you're going to have to pay yep. extra on your deductible. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how that ecosystem, you've obviously got the likes of Mars that are a big food provider. They've also owned their own veterinary clinic. So there are a number of players sort of vying to try and, be the center of this ecosystem. So it'll be interesting to see how, how that pans out over the next few years. Well, maybe they're building the United Health of, uh, of pet insurance. Uh, United Health, basically they have almost a full uh, vertical integration from almost including the pharmaceutical, but more about the pharmacies, <clears throat> the hospitals, the Medicare, all the different things that do they have the bro the pharmacy benefit system? I'm not sure, but yeah. So Joe could be doing that. I think Mars. If you look at Mars's sort of pet e ecosystem, they do pretty much everything. They don't have insurance, but they do everything from grooming to food to to. Uh, yeah, it's a whole whole. If you look at it, there's about ten different pet businesses they own. Um, so um, or categories hmm. of, of pet business. So um, yeah, I mean they they must that can only be a period of time until someone comes up with that full ecosystem model. Which is scary when it comes to health because then you understand that you don't have other options. Okay, that, I think that we, we, we made it a little bit um, depressing. Let's try <laughs> to pick it up somehow. Um, do you mind tilting the camera and show the audience your amazing collection of Marsh amplifiers? <laughs> uh, <of my, laughs> Hang on, let me see Marshall if I can uh, oh. Look at that. Uh, that's a great pick me up, including. So, what's the guitar <laughs> that you have behind you? Uh, so, what is that one? Um, I don't know if you can see that. Oh, actually. yeah, a few. Oh, a few. Uh, so, one of those was a, a hand built um, Patrick Eggle guitar, was built in Birmingham, that I bought in the early 90s. Um, another one is a Japanese Squire Stratocaster, so made by Fender. Oh, wow. Uh, but it's been totally customized. Uh, I love that guitar. Um, so, yeah, I've got a few guitars. It's a, a little hobby of mine, I guess, uh, when I'm not working. How often do you play? Well, according to all these, uh, all those marshals, you, you play a little bit because I've seen so many talented, so many musicians in our industry. Yeah, I don't play as much as I'd like to, it would be fair to say. Uh, but I try and play as much as I can. Um, and actually, my guitar playing did cross swords with insurance once when we launched um, Many Pets in the US. Uh, I, I came on the Zoom call in front of the 400 employees we had at the time. Uh, and played uh, Star Spangled Banner, Jimi Hendrix style um, on the guitar, which was kind of fun. How's your teeth? Yeah, I still do have them, just about. Okay, no, <laughs> so no there. But yeah, no, uh, actually I didn't play with teeth that day, I, I'll be honest, but um, but yeah, plenty of wah wah. But that, that was good fun. <laughs> Love that. Wonderful. Um, let's, let's start dropping this up. So I'll ask you the last question that I'm asking everyone who comes uh, on the show, do you have any advice to give the audience? 
something that you picked up in your life, career-wise, or just personal growth? Sure. I think a um, piece of advice I'd probably give is to put your energy and hard work into the early stages of a project. So whether this is setting up a new business, whether it's launching a new product in a new country, or whether it's just a big project, is I'm a massive proponent of that upfront work. So make sure you do your research. Make sure you really understand the, 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 the sort of landscape that you're going to be working in, that you know what the challenges are and the risks. Make sure that you've got a, a clear strategy, well, a clear objective of what you want to achieve. You've got a strategy to get there, that your teams have operational plans that sort of say, this is how we're going to support that strategy and get to that vision. Make sure you've aligned all your stakeholders. Make sure you've um, really communicate well. And, and the key thing for me is have some metrics that tell you how you're doing. Uh, if you speak to anyone who's ever worked for me, they'll tell you that I'm really nervous until I've got a plan because I like to have a plan and know when things are sort of going off piece a bit so I can course correct. And uh, I'm always a bit antsy until I've got that plan. But that, that for me, I think is probably my key learning in life is don't scrimp on that early setup and rush into doing something is do your homework. You'll save yourself hopefully a lot of time and possibly a lot of money later on if, if you do that hard work up front. So no learn on the, on the fly. Uh, I don't disagree with that. I mean, you, you've got to, you've got to. If no, you, with if music, you, there, there is always a trade-off, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's a ratio. Yeah. So you've got, if, you, if you're going to innovate, you're going to try new things and won't necessarily have a plan. But your plan is kind of like, I'm going to spend some time innovating and, and it's going to be okay if I'm not relying on revenues from that. And if it fails, that's okay. But I think when you're doing a big kind of, uh, and I'm thinking of um, like a country launch, you don't mm-hmm. want to go barreling into the US if you haven't really un- understood how you, what your go-to-market strategy is, how much it's going to cost you, because it is expensive doing business in the US or launching in any country is expensive. But unless if you haven't done your homework and really know what you're getting into. So I, I'll give you an example. Um, if we've got time, uh, going to Sweden, for instance, you'd say, okay, at the time, UK and Sweden, both members of the European Union before Brexit, both sitting, uh, both uh, uh, under the guidance of the European Union Insurance Directive. So you'd say, oh, insurance regulations will be the same in both countries. But actually, both countries interpreted those regulations differently or that insurance directive mm. differently and had a different set of regulations. And so if you hadn't done that research up front, you might just think, well, it's going to be the same. I don't need to change my systems or processes or anything. Barrel into the country and then suddenly go, oh, hang on a minute. There's actually quite a lot of nuances that we need to change our systems and processes that we might have used in the UK to go and launch in Sweden. I would think the same thing will go for data an- analysis and understanding the market, because as you mentioned earlier regarding the US, you approach it during COVID or before COVID. And then there is a question of the potential or the accessible market here, where you think it's like, okay, there is only 3% penetration, there are about 70 million uh, pets, but was it just the hiccup of COVID? Or is it actually a trend going up over time because people sometimes see the hiccup and because it was a hiccup of two or three years will it last and will it increase basically was that the step a function that will increase that trend by yeah, that? i mean interesting covid was almost the opposite for most for pet insurance as most businesses is like certainly in the uk everyone got a lockdown mm-hmm. pet here in the uk we had a great year. We went into the year going, oh, this could be a challenging year, but actually it was a, it was a gangbusters year. It was, it was amazing. Um, but I think if you even if you go back at the, the, the NAPFIA stats I was talking to earlier, yeah, the last four years, it's all been over 20, 25%. But even if you look further back than that, it's always been in the, the high teens, early 20s percent. So it just feels like it's a trend that's going to be here for some time, I believe. In One fact, point. I think... There's more and more awareness coming of insurance. So I wouldn't be surprised if we saw the sort of growth rate sort of steepen. Mm-hmm. Steve, thank you very, very much for your time, your knowledge and uh, educating us. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you.